Good evening, everyone. We are continuing our question series. And the last time we spoke about Gezel Shena, someone who sleeps, if we wake him up. We spoke about buying stolen merchandise, heaven for animals, suffering of animals, etc. Today, we continue I bought a video, a film, and it says or not, there's restriction to lend it to others. They don't want you to lend it to others because they want them also to buy. If I lend it to others, do I violate the rules of the Torah or no? The person that sell me a movie or music or a lecture or anything on a CD, do I have a restriction to lend it to others to use it and to give back, or a book? No restriction. The answer is, it's allowed to lend, and no one can forbid lending what they sell. Once they sell, they have no control of what they sold already. I went to a vending machine. I put money for one can of soda, and two came out. It's going to be very complicated to find out who, who owns this vending machine, to make an investigation, to call people, to locate him, to drive to him. For a can of soda, it will probably cost him 50 cents, not even. Do I have an obligation to return it, to leave it there, or I can just take it and use it? The best thing is to leave it there. Somebody you else. leave it there, someone else will steal okay. it. Okay, let it be somebody else, you think, not me. Okay. The answer is, you're allowed to take it. Why? Because we have a rule. Thank you. We have a rule that when you have an obligation to return a lost object, it has to be reasonable. If the object worth two dollars and it will cost you fifty dollars to return it, obviously it doesn't make any sense. Even the owner of the item would agree that you didn't have an obligation to return it to him, or any no such thing. Plus, you, 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 have, you have the right to demand for payment for how much it costs you to return it, then you get very upset. So what kind of a fool you are? You're making me pay you now $50 for returning me something that worth $2? Just give it for tzedakah or do something with that. Have common sense. The teacher told us that we have to buy a specific book for learning. But we're only going to learn a few pages in this book. I want to make a copy from my friend's book to save me from buying the book. Am I allowed, even it says in the beginning of the book, copyright, you cannot copy or use this book for public or all kinds of things like this. Am I allowed to make copies? Yes, for yourself, you can make it right. The answer is yes. Even if they say it's not allowed to make copies, once he owns it, he can do whatever he wants with that. There's nothing ah, like... For commercial purposes, for yourself. You Even for commercial purposes, the Arposkim will say he can do, but it's not, uh, definitely, it's not something nice to do. What you, what you hate people doing to you, you don't do to them. But to say that no one can make a copy, he can borrow the book and write it with his own hands. What are you going to do? You're not allowed to write what's in a book. So obviously, he doesn't steal from him anything. Anyway, he wouldn't buy the book. So he did not lose anything. CDs are the same? Uh, CDs, it depends who you ask. Some poskim allow it. Some poskim say, no, it's Dina de Malchuta. It's against the rules of the state, of the country. But even if it's not the country, Rebbe, if it's the intellectual property of somebody, and I'm making the copy, and I'm distributing it, not for myself, but distributing it 
even for free. For it's distribution, for distribution, it's a lot worse because then already it's a suffix the right already an isur the right. for free. Yes. Also the quality of the copyright. Well, if they won't buy it, then in the end, really that person did not lose anything. The opposite, he got some fame. And, and maybe those people who use it recommended it to others and they bought it. Nice it worked for his own benefit. Nice, nice try. If people... <laughs> nice, nice try. You oh, nice you... Oh, 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 oh. I have a little headache today. Today, trying to keep it quiet. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like how many questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now. Now, next question. Uh, Is light detector machine can be used in halacha to suspect a person? Maybe not to convict him, but to suspect him and begin to check him out. Or it's choshet bekshirim. Because remember, every time, every time we're going to investigate a person that is a suspect, there's always a chance it's not him in the end. If you're going to say, oh, there's no, no permission to suspect people, most of the cases you'll never find a criminal. So you suspect people based on certain things. Either people saw him there, or he, he behaved suspicious, or he already have a record. There's different reasons. In the end, it wasn't him. So if he says a person that has a record, then he cannot complain that people suspect him. He earned it. He earned it, and he deserved it. However, someone who has a clean reputation, can they force him to come and have a lie detector check to know if to continue an investigation against him or not? Of course, no. Of course, no. Often, yes. The machine has a chazaka, and at most times it does convict. Right. So the answer is, machine is not reliable because there's ways to trick it. There are people who know how to trick it. So therefore, it, since it's not a reliable thing, even if the majority of the time it will show the truth, the fact that there's 10 or 20% chance that it, it doesn't show the truth, you can convict a person based on something like that, that's a very big crime. Therefore, therefore all usage of, of, a, of a lie detector, it's not reliable and not allowed in a Jewish halacha. Not to force a person to do it, unless if he volunteer himself, it's a different story, and not to use what came out Maybe, maybe if he agree, you can use it to put pressure on him to confess. Because now he knows people already think, you know, so he makes, he puts some pressure on him. So he breaks up and he says, okay, I did it, I'm sorry, here it is, take it back. And in the end, no one lost. But to convict him and force to take something out of him based on that, you cannot do it. Then, next question. My wife does something in the university. They gave her an assignment to do. She's not so clever. She wants me to do it for her. Can I do it for her? Even though she's the one supposed to do it? In the end, she serves it. She gets a mark, and that's it. She pays for it. husband can help his wife, since it says, So there's a, there's a difference between helping a little bit, which she doesn't understand something, she come and she asks, and you explain to her, and while you're explaining to her, she learns, that's very good, even the professor is happy. It's like a private tutor, what's the difference? But to actually do the whole thing, not allowed. To help her allowed, or anybody else. To do the entire thing, not allowed. People pay to write term papers, like, you know, there's Organizations, like, is that allowed? Like, you allowed to pay somebody? I just answered that, not allowed. But it's paying for But it's not him, they're not giving it's paying money. for the time. But the, univer the, the university that check it and give a mark to Mr. X, if they knew that Mr. X did not touch it, somebody, he paid money to someone and he did the test for him, would they agree to test, to test the test know. for him? The only one is the money. The university's care. You, you're, right about, you're right about what you say, but now after they took the money, and they found out that someone else did it for you. They agree to give you a mark or they throw you out of the class. That's it. So obviously it's violating the, the agreements that you went into term with them. Hey, I copy for my friend in a test and I got a good mark and now my parents want to buy me an expensive gift. 
Well, I, I eat my heart because I know I did not really deserve this gift. But if I tell them I cheated on a test, I will make it worse. So am I allowed to get the gift because I'm embarrassed to tell them how I got that mark? The answer is there's only one solution. What is it? Go and get this test again and do the same score. Almost. You're almost right. <laughs> not far. The answer is you don't have to do the test again, but you have to go over the material and learn it very good which means that if you had to go now tomorrow to the test, you will really get this mark. And therefore, no one lost. The school gave you retroactive a good mark. Well, what's the big deal? The school wants you to know the material. One way or the other, you didn't lie. You got the material. You did it the day later. Your parents happy. The school would be happy retroactively if they find out. And you, so you fix the problem. If you already did. Right. Yeah, of course. If you already did and you went and learned it, then in the end nobody really lost. What sin is involved? Lying? Is that the sin? What sin are we talking about? Oh, nah, it's yeah. called. Yeah, there's Gnevada, Tona, oh, nah, there's few sins. Goim is Gnevada. Yes, yes, even Goim. And it says like this. So make them a copy. Is it allowed? Sure. If it's allowed for regular book, it wouldn't be allowed for Sidur. Well, I don't know. It's like stealing and praying at the same time. It's not stealing. If she cannot afford to buy the Sidur, anyway, they didn't lose anything because she won't buy it. <laughs> Bottom line, if you ask the owner of the Sidur company, there is a poor person who wants to pray, but they don't have money. Am I allowed to make them copy? Of course he would say yes, because anyway he doesn't lose. Anyway they won't buy. So at least another Jew would pray. Most likely he would send them Sidur for free. That's what most Jews would do. If they find out someone wants to pray and cannot afford a Sidur. The question is this, Reverend. Of course they will send it. You already talk and then move your head. <laughs> you first shoot and then you go like this, <laughs> pretending you ask permission. <laughs> Yes. What is it, the Russian style or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, of course they will give the receipt to do. Of course it's been smart to give the copy because otherwise they wouldn't pray. Yeah. But the thing is, one thing is you ask the company or printing company saying, can I make the copy or can you send a free sidur? Or you ask Rabbi and the shul, can we give a free sidur to this person? This way I understand. But making a copy yourself, making a decision yourself, saying, okay, I don't care. They will give it anyway. Who gave you such a right to make a decision? They didn't lose anything. They cannot take you to Bedin and claim they lost anything. They, know. Maybe this they don't have a buy. case. Maybe this person was, would buy. Maybe next month. They're poor. Would buy. They don't have money to buy a city. Yeah, yeah, today is poor, tomorrow not poor. You made the copy. This person will never buy it. This, uh, Get back to me when they become rich. <laughs> <laughs> is it allowed to drive without a seat belt? Yes. What you, are you obligated from the Torah to put a seat belt or no? Even if the law of the state allows it. If the law of the state allows it? No, then you cannot. The answer is you must wear seat belt at all time from the Torah, regardless of what the state think. Why? Because it's life risk. Many people die for not wearing seat belt. It's enough. Your life is in a higher risk. There's no permission to increase the risk to your life in any given moment of your life, even for one minute. Therefore, you have to do it. Second, second, there's a, we can ask about this, but Hashem, we count on Hashem to watch us. It's not the same. We have Hashem. We pray to Him every day. The answer is Hashem punish the foolish people. If they have regular, natural way to protect themselves and they didn't, He won't help them. And if he will help them, he'll take away from their rewards. We'll clean from their rewards. So or either way, they lose. So they must put seat belt. Next thing, next thing is cell phone someone, cell phone was already a different story. Depend on the person. Some people, if they talk on a cell phone, they're really not in the, on the road. They don't pay attention. 
But some people, they can talk on the cell phone and they can drive and it doesn't affect their driving any, I mean, they put it on a speaker and they drive and they talk. It's like talking to someone who sits next to you. What's the difference? If you sit, if you sit with a friend, no, no, we ask, we ask from the Torah, from the state, we know what, what you have to. From the Torah, when you drive, you're allowed to talk, you're allowed to talk. Talking doesn't interfere with your driving. But now when you say, okay, so I'm not allowed to hold the phone, but what about if I hold coffee? Anyway, I drive with one hand. Most people drive with one hand. It's com more comfortable for them to go like this. It's more comfortable. The, the, anyone ever prove that holding the wheel in one hand or two, it makes a difference? So the question is, if he holds a, I don't know, a little coffee, or he holds a towel in his hand, or something like that, what's the difference between holding it or holding the phone? I guess the combination of holding the phone and talking already is really maybe distract some people. Is the reaction time? One way or the other, if it's the law of the state, you have to do it, that's it. And if not, you're going to pay $400. <laughs> okay, the cell phone is, if you drink a coffee, you take the one with, wheel with one hand and drink a coffee. But when you talk on the phone, you talk, 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 and what you do with the second line, second phone call, you look, you switch, and at this time you're not looking at the road. I feel like it's a Gemara with Rashi. <laughs> I am the Gemara, it is Rashi. <laughs> what about downloading songs or videos from YouTube that is free or Nifnet? So a CD, maybe the guy would not want you to download it because he wants you to buy it. That would be allowed because that was already published to the whole world. So you can just... They themselves publish it to the world knowing it will affect their selling CDs. Right. Because they get money from YouTube. Yeah, they pay them for every time someone click on it. So one way or the other, they make money. Someone, uh, someone that drive and cross a white line on the on the road, he cross the road. Do I have an obligation to call and report him by his plate number or no? Understand the question. You mean the yellow line? Uh, he cross the line. Driving, risking the other people's life, it is your obligation. If you just, you just change the lane, but it's just by the state law, then you don't have to. The answer, since it's a pikuach nefesh, you can risk people, then there's an obligation to report him to prevent problems. I drove in a cab, and the driver drove instead of 55, 70 something. Uh, do I have an obligation to report him, or I have to think about him losing his job and his children? It's going to be too much of a punishment for what he did. So now it comes back to what we spoke last week. If driving faster than what they put, if it's even a risk or not. In Germany, they drive 200 miles an hour, 220 miles an hour, 250 miles an hour. They fly over there, the special highways. No, nobody gets more hurt than here. No. 250 miles an hour. No, no way. Yes, people no, with, a, with sport car in Germany. I spoke to someone who lived there. He told me I drove 200 miles an hour and someone passed me like I'm standing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how, how did he tell me that? We were driving to Canada. So he said, my mother was with me in a car, the guy say, and she say, how do you drive so fast? You're crazy. And then when someone passed, you see, you see, I'm not even fast, look. <laughs> you understand? So if, if it can be proven that driving faster by 10, 20 miles extra, it's really increasing the risk, in that case, it's like crossing the, the line. It's no different. It's a life risk. In my personal opinion, it's not increasing the risk at all, especially with the good cars they make today. They're much more reliable than the old cars. So, of course, they're not talking someone who really drives crazy and cut and do all kinds of things. Someone who drives on the lane straight uh, doesn't really affect anyone. Okay, now, 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 well, 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 now it's like this. Next question, it says like this. If I sit with my friend and I took a ride with someone, right? We want to talk in the back seat, but I may disturb the driver. The driver is willing to give us a ride, but who's to say that this is now once in the next hour headache of two people talking? We're allowed to talk 
or we have to sit quiet the entire ride? Depends on the guy. Kind of huh? Depends on the guy. Ask him. Nice guy. Is it okay if I talk? What are you going to do? You're going to ask, excuse me, mister, uh, do you mind if we talk? What is he going to say? No, no, be quiet, don't move. Same, same thing, no, it's the same thing. You can, you can ask about the phone. Speaking on the phone, it could be chutzpah. Why are you now talking on the phone? Wait. And now you're sitting with your friend and you talk. Now nah, it's a natural reaction. Allowed or not allowed? Right. Not allowed. In the taxi? Not even quietly. Not even quietly. And believe it or not, it really disturbed the drivers. It really disturbed them. Next thing, a driver is giving me a ride and he's texting while he's driving. Am I allowed to tell him to stop? Or oh, I'm a guest in his house, in his car, so now you don't have the, the nerve to tell people what to do in their own house. Or since it's involved with life risk and it's also risking my life, so even though he's doing me a favor, still have to stop him from what he's doing. Kindly apologize and get off the car. <laughs> the answer is you cannot tell him that, but you're allowed to go to get off. Tell him stop for me and get off. And then when he asks you, why? You say that you're going to Tel Aviv. So we didn't get there yet. So he said, I don't want to tell you how to drive. But when you text, I'm getting nervous. So I say, oh, OK, stay, stay, no problem. I won't text. Most likely, that's going to be. But if you tell him, he gets angry. He may even throw you out of the car. <laughs> right, now, now, I was hitchhiking in a place that the driver not supposed to really stop. And someone stopped for me in the middle of the road. There's no permission to stand there on the side of the road. Police came and gave him a ticket. Do I have to pay the ticket? I made him stop, and he got a ticket. I mean, I asked him to stop. He didn't have to. Is it my obligation because I caused him to get the ticket? Or the driver has permission to obey the rules, and if somebody asks him to do something not right, and he did it, that's his responsibility. Like you're asking a taxi driver, make, make a U-turn, I'm in a rush. And he makes a U-turn for you, thinking he's going to get a nicer tip. And the police caught him. Do you have to pay him for that U-turn? Same question. The answer is, you don't have an obligation, but it would be very nice and ethical to pay the entire thing, or at least to offer. Offer and say to Elim that he won't accept your offers. <laughs> I have a guy in school who always asks me to give him a ride because we live in the same neighborhood. The problem with this guy is that he eats in a car, cannot stop eating, this guy. So he eats and he leaves dirt, crumbs, bags, you know. Once in a while, he, he makes the car dirty. So do I have to take him? Or I can make him an excuse and not take him because of the way he behaves. Is Chesed justified to suffer the dirt and all that? Or I don't have to go out of my way to do Chesed if he dirty the car or whatever the case is, or he make noise, whatever. The answer is, you don't have an obligation to take him. You don't have an obligation. You can tell the person, I'll take you in one condition. You don't bring any food. You don't eat. That's something you can do. Uh, If, I, if someone gives me a ride and I put headphones on me, and I, therefore maybe you were thinking I'm going to have someone to talk to now on the ride, and now it's maybe not a nasty that I put it, which means I'm not interested to talk to you. I want to listen to my music or sure to what. Do I have to get, ask him permission? With your permission, I want to put it on? Or I just put it on and he get, he get the point that he won't have anyone to talk to? Is it Choser Derech Eretz? Is it really a sin? What is it? Putting your headphones on, blocking your ears from his, you know, conversation. What do you think? You have to ask. It's ethical. The answer, it's very nice manners if you say with your permission, do you mind if I hear? 
And of course, he's going to say yes. But if you did it without him, you don't owe him. They don't have an obligation just because they give you a right to become his uh, kind of his chevruta now, you know? Uh, next question. What's better, to pray alone at home or in Minyan on the bus? The bus says some of them have Minyanim, like from Monsi to Manhattan. They have everything, even Sefer Torah they have on the bus. Minyan. Driving Minyan. So what's going on now? You leave the house, but the hour it takes you to get to the city, you pray on the bus. So it really doesn't take away from your time. Anyway, you have to sit on the bus. You save time. Otherwise, you go to shul for an hour, and then you drive for an hour. So what's better now? To pray at home or on a, on a bus that is moving with Minyan? Absolutely pray home. And not the <laughs> Today, very good. Everything you say so far, opposite. <laughs> Minyan is above everything. Minyan, above everything. Minyan is, Minyan is coming before praying alone, but if the Minyan is disturbing the other people that do not pray, then it's, that's mitzvah baba avera, like they do in the El Al plains. They pray in the back and they disturb everyone who wants to go to the bathroom. So some rabbis, they pray alone in their seat in the morning when they fly to Israel. That's really what happened. But if it's like the Monsi bus, that they, the entire back of the bus becomes a shul and the rest of the people sit in the front, doesn't bother them. Anyway, there's no bathroom on the, there's no bathroom on the, on the bus. So nobody, nobody loses anything. And of course, Minyan justify it. I found money on a bus. Who does the money belong to? There's no, first, there's no siman on money. No, we cannot describe money because everyone knows how money looks. You may say, maybe, I, maybe this person wrote his name. You see, you found money, Yosef, Yosef, Yosef. On each bill, it's a Yosef with a red marker. So you can describe that it's your money, right? How do you know? Maybe it was your friend, and you saw that it says on it, Yosef, and you were in later and claim it's yours. It can be someone else. It's money does not have siman, money that fell on the floor. So the question now, we have a rule. If money falls into someone's property, the property buys it. So the owner of the property gets it. But what happens if the money falls in a public territory? The answer is the one who finds it takes it to himself. Is the bus considered private territory that belongs to the bus company? It's a private company or even a government company. And therefore, you have to give it to the driver to give it to the company. Or maybe the bar driver is in charge of this bus, so everything that gets lost on the bus and no one claims, he takes for himself because he's like in charge of the bus. Or you take it because it's a public territory. You know, give the public permission to walk there, to sit there. What's the answer? The answer, you keep it. Not only on a bus, even if you found the money in a shul, even if you found the money in a yeshiva floor, if you found the money in places that the public has permission to come, it's yours. But if you find the money in the backyard of your friend, so you walk in the street, the, the grass finishes right here by the sidewalk. One step into his grass, you find money there on the grass. And you picked it up. He doesn't know. So it fell from someone's pocket into his property. And you picked it up, it's pure stealing. Like you stole it from his house. Yes, once he hit his property, it belongs to him. That's the rule. Next thing, same thing in the store. Same thing in the store. The side, From the counter to the door, it's yours. From the counter inside, it's to the owner of the store. Next question. Is a man allowed to sit next to a woman on a bus, or better to stand? She sits, there's a chair next to her, and he wants to sit. Style, whatever. So sometimes you find that they stand, they don't sit. Is he allowed to sit or no? The answer, absolutely yes. No problem. What's the problem? Sit and turn his face to the other side. Even if she's not modest, he doesn't look at her. Turns to the other side, finish. 
even a little touch, there's no intention. Better to, to try to stay away. But even if you touch a little bit, there's no intention to it. It's allowed. And a train, a train, you're allowed to go on a train that is like sardines, knowing it may happen almost for sure. You're allowed to do it. Somebody asked me to watch his bag in a bus stop or the train terminal when he went to the bathroom and my bus showed up. <laughs> if I get it on that and somebody steals it, I told him that I'm going to watch it. He went to the bathroom. What do I do? Do I have to miss my bus and wait another half an hour now for the next one? Yes. Since I, I told him I watch it? Or he had to assume that there's a risk that my bus will show up and I'm not going to sit here and watch it all day for him. Did he tell you? No. It's not a shomer sacha. The answer, I have to, I'm allowed to assign another shomer. Excuse me, can you watch it? And the guy will come soon. No problem. He's going to steal the laptop. You don't have to lose your bus because of that. No one else is around, you have to wait. No one is around, you, you still can get on your bus. But if someone is around, then you tell them it's better than nothing. But after doesn't mean you have to lose money for him. Or time. Now, next question. Tomorrow, the bus company is raising the fare. Am I allowed to go and buy many tickets in advance today? Knowing I cannot use it today. I'm only going to use it in the future. But I buy it today, and I actually trick them, because now they're going to lose on the, on the future fares. They Why they raise the fare? Maybe gas prices went up. So now they keep the same profit. They only increase by what it costs them another dollar per person, let's say. So they increase it by a dollar. But now I'm, I bought many of them. So therefore, now they're giving me service for the old price, and it costs them more because I paid in advance for those cards. Now now I've been using it for the next year. Is that stealing, deceiving, or it's permitted? The answer, of course, is permitted. They don't want to sell. Let them don't sell a day or two before. Why are you still selling? You're selling knowing people will use it in the future, and you're not protesting. So it's fine. I have a tree that is by the path on the street. And fruit falls into the, into, on the floor, like cherries, and they make the floor red, dirty. And the neighbors came, and they complained against me that my tree make the public territory dirty. Can they go and have a claim against me, or there's nothing they can do to me from the Torah? Well, it's public, so it's not there, it's just anyway. So that's, a, that's the point. A person allowed that his tree will make the public territory dirty? My answer is, this is the way Hashem made the world. This tree, if, it would be, if my house wouldn't be here, so what would be? It would be just trees. So the tree would make the public territory dirty. Now I bought this property. Okay, so this tree became mine. But with or without me, the tree, from the time the world was created, was, his leaves were falling on the streets or whatever. Why are you holding me responsible? Or the answer is, doesn't matter what was here before. Now you own it. Now it's your property. Your property make damage to the public. You have no permission. If you can it in a certain way, it doesn't the street. The question is, well, of course, everybody agreed that it's better to trim it, that it won't make the floor dirty. The question is, can they do anything against me legally? They take me now to bed in, the neighbors. So it makes our streets dirty. It ruins the value of our homes, that the streets are all dirty like this from his leaves. Do they have a claim or no? No. Yes. I have no claim. The answer is, you have to cut the branches that makes fruits fall into the public territory. But there's a problem. If it's a fruit tree, do I, are you allowed to cut fruit tree? The answer is not to take the old tree out from the roots, but to trim it, you're allowed and sometimes obligated. But it's better to do it by a gardener that is not Jewish. Even if he only trims some branches and you take the fruit and eat them or whatever, or you give them to your, to your animals, one way or the other, always better to do these things by a non-Jew. A student came in a school 
and he saw a, a glass that looked empty, and he took it and put water inside and drank it, and there was my contact lens inside. <laughs> it happened. He took his contact lens, he didn't know where to put it, so he put them in a plastic cup. Someone saw an empty cup. He put water, he didn't see it, he drank it in one shot. $300. We have to see the insides. Contact lens. Who has to pay? Who lost? The contact lens. The answer, the person that drank the contact lens, <laughs> the contact lenses, is not responsible to pay anything. Why? No one in the world would ever assume that in an empty cup there's a free contact lens. What happened if in shul you took your glasses off and you put it on a chair next to you and someone came and sat? He didn't pay attention and crashed your Armani $1,000 special made glasses. Or your hat. Or your hat. Who has to pay? You put the money in your right pocket to your left pocket. So the person say, what, you're blind? You don't see what you're sitting on? So this person says, do I have an obligation to check the chair before I sit on it? Chair is a holder for glasses. Chair is supposed to be empty, or when it's not empty, there's a person in it, nothing else. But then the person say, who told you? You can, to, you can put other things on chairs. So they ended up in bed din. What happened? It's, very, it's not an easy question, this one. Very easy question. I don't have to look at that. I don't look every day when I stand in a chair. I just sit. The chair is for sitting. So there is no case. Don't put your glasses on the chair because it's not supposed to be the place. Where we That's the bottom line. A person has to check the chair before he sits or no? No. Maybe it's dirty. Maybe it's wet. That's what he's checking for himself, if he wants to. But he doesn't check on a regular basis, he doesn't check at this time. The answer, the answer is he doesn't have to pay for the glasses. What if the glasses first, does he have to pay him? The glasses first, the one sitting down, does he have to pay him? <laughs> for what? For the little pain that he got? Let's say no, let's say he needs stitches, he has to go to the Yes, he has to pay. Yes. If he's dismissed from paying for the glasses, obviously it's the guy's fault, then, he, then he's responsible for damages. What about other movies? Am I allowed to make damages to my parents' television that it keeps breaking until they stop watching their nonsense on television or no? Yeah. To save them from the scenes? If it's cable. <laughs> ah, what do you think? In the Torah it says that Abraham Avinu smashed the statues of his father Terach. He smashed the statues of his idols. idols. That's the his father's idols. What's worse, Avodah Zarah or television? <laughs> Yeah, when Rabbi Malka came to Mexico, he threw out from the window. Yeah, and Malka took the television in Mexico and threw it from the window. <laughs> yeah, but he said to the guy, tell me how much it costs, I'll pay you. If you're willing to pay, then of course, there's no question here. I'm saving you right now from the scene. The children watching the dirt there. As a Jew, I have an obligation to save these children. If the father is a fool, then my obligation now to save another Jew, right? There's many, many obligations here. Oh, we spoke about it many times that to save a Jew, you're allowed. The question is, the question is now, you're allowed to do it to your parents. I mean, you live by them and may create tension if you get caught. Who are you saving to? when you are breaking somebody else's television, not there. Who do you think you're saving? Nobody. You're going to buy another television. <laughs> it's enough. It will take three, four days until they buy it. You already saved them for three, four days. This is Hilul Hashem. You are a religious person. You are putting your religion this way, forcing people. Wait until they go to the bathroom, then smash it. Don't smash it in their face. <laughs> You really try to, 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 you really try, right? <laughs> I got money from the insurance. The mechanic submitted a claim to the insurance for the damage in my car, collision, whatever it was. Let's say it was $2,000.
By the time, a week later that he finished the job, we became friendly, so he took a $500 discount from the actual price, that it's worth 2000 Now, the insurance already sent me the check for $2,000, but I ended up paying $1,500. Do I have to give the insurance $500 back? Or it's like consider getting a gift from a friend. What is it, their business? The price of the damage is $2,000. i am paying you full premium. And when finally there's a damage, this is the real value. He did not overprice when he say 2000 So you pay the 2000 that I deserve for the damage. Now, if I have a brother that is a mechanic or a collision guy, and he did it for free for me, so now he did the favor to you or to me? To me. So it looks very simple that you can keep the money. You can keep the money. The one but what is the law? Not everything that makes logic to us, it's really the law. So you pay premium on a monthly basis or whatever it is to be fully compensated for the full amount of repairs. After that, you repair, you don't repair, you sell a car as is for the same amount of money without the repair. This is your money, this is your insurance. Is that the law? If this is the law? It makes a lot of sense what you say, but let's say if you say it to the insurance company in the day you sign, you add on the side, you are responsible to pay me for the value of any damage that will happen to my car, whether I'll fix it or not. But that's exactly and they say amen and sign. Yes, but they say it, amen and sign. It is there. It says we pay you for the damages. You don't have obligation to fix it. You can do I'm asking. I, I don't know. Is that the law Absolutely. of the country? Absolutely. Yes? Absolutely. So if they find out that you never fix the car, they cannot get their money back? They may come in a small printing and write over there that all money that we gave you is based on the assumption you fixed the car. And if we find out you did not fix the car, we are entitled to ask you to return the money. Maybe that's in a contract. How do you know? It also makes sense. They can tell you, my friend, if it doesn't bother you, that means there's no damage. That's why you didn't fix it. You can manage without it. We are paying for what you want us to fix. We are not paying you. We're paying the person who fix. We don't have anything to no, do with you. Paying to you. This is your policy. That's the you question insure. now. You insure it, not the mechanic is insure it. You get the money. You can keep this car forever if you want. You can continue to find the cheaper part, cheaper mechanic, and whatever you want to break it apart and sell it as a part. You are the one who is insuring, not the mechanic. That's why they're paying it to you, not to the mechanic. <laughs> Only if you assign it to them and tell them, I allow you to pay my mechanic. Only on this condition. This is your part. One, f one person cursed me that I should be poor. Should I worry about it? Should I, took, should I take any precaution against it or do anything? Special prayer? Something that the curse will go back to him? What should I do? Or just ignore him and not to worry about the curse? The answer is, curses, just a curse, does not work. It goes back to the person who cursed. It goes on him. So if you're a kosher Jew, pray that the curse won't go back on him. That's a level. What if a rabbi curses? And definitely pension going on. That's a problem. <laughs> a kosher rabbi doesn't curse you, unless if you fight against the Torah, and unless you sell drugs to people, there's, there's things that justify to kill someone, or even to kill him. If it's justified to kill him, why wouldn't justify to kill him to die? It's, even, it's less. What's worse, to take a knife and kill him, or to pray or to curse him that Hashem will take him away? To kill him is immediate, right away, and it's a certain death. And sometimes in a law, it requires to kill him. It requires to kill specific wicked people, not everyone. So in that case, it's, it's, a very, it's a very complicated thing. For instance, if I see a Jew with a torch about to come and burn a Sefer Torah, and the only way to prevent it is from kill, by killing him, do I allow, am I allowed to kill him? Or with all the, pay, the, the horrible pain of seeing a Sefer Torah is burning, Someone who burns a Sefer Torah doesn't say in the Torah you have to execute him. It's a very, very wicked person. Does he deserve Chayav Mita? Someone who burns Sefer Torah, Chayav Mita? Huh? 
It's a good point. If obviously I can prevent him from doing it, I have to. But if the only way to prevent him is pushing him from the terrace or something. It's the only way, because he's bigger, stronger. If I try to fight him, he'll throw me from the terrace. So without him being ready, I push him. I send him to Bin Laden and then Arafat together in the same room. And the Sefer Torah got saved. If it's a bad guy, then by pushing him, you're going to kill him, maybe not. That's a very hard question. It just came to me now. What's the answer? I don't know. We have to check. Huh? Why were this week's parasha, so why are they so afraid of uh, Bilal first the Jews? It's a different story. It was a Navi, he had Ainara. It's a different story. His father was a, a Navi also. Uh, a car blocked me in a parking. Public parking or my own parking. Half of my driveway is blocked, so it's very hard. To, he left me a little room to come out, but it's very on, on inches. And I have to do maneuvers, reverse, back, and, yeah, and I broke his mirror. And then he came. Oh, I caught you. Bad Dean. Do you have to pay him for the mirror or for the damage? No. Oh, no. He stole your property by being blocked. He may say, it's true, I'm not fair that I blocked you. But after all, I left you enough room, and a good driver will be able to get out of it. You don't know how to drive, you have to pay. Or, he can say also, if I blocked you and you felt that you cannot get your car out, so you would take a cab and take me to bed in and ask me to pay you for the cab. Now you made me damage. Everyone who does something wrong right away, you retaliate. What is it? Zimbabwe here? You have rules here. Huh? You should call the tow truck, take his car away, and he will pay for that at the time he's ready to get out. Man, so good luck taking the money out of him for the tow no, truck. No, no, the company who can release no, his no. car is going to take it. It's not my problem anymore. But I don't think they can take the car if there's no signs or warning. Your driver, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The driver, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You show them your ID saying it's not my car, take it. That's the law? Yeah, yeah. that's the law. I didn't know you were a lawyer. <laughs> Is there anything else you're hiding? <laughs> you sure you're not a catcher best spy? What do you think I do? I'll decide to go to Stay in court. Answer is if you made him a damage, it's his problem. It's his problem. You don't have to pay him anything. Next question I went to the hospital to pray for my friend that was there in the healing books. And while I was praying, I started to cry, and lots of tears went on the pages and made them you know, crooked now. they wavy. Do I have to buy them a new Tehillim? I can take the, this one and buy them a new one, since I made damage to the pages, or no? <laughs> the answer is, that's the purpose of the Tehillim, to get wet from the tears. <laughs> so when you put in a public place such as a hospital, Tehillim, you know right away in three, four weeks it's going to be all broken to pieces from the tears of people. You understand? So they so obviously you agree to still put it there knowing that's what's going to happen. <sighs> Let's see what else. Lashon Hara about secular people. Not Shomer Shabbos people, Apikorsim, Reshaim, haters of Hashem, haters of rabbis, haters of the Torah, haters of Halakha, lovers of the terrorists, liberal Jews who destroy us for already hundreds of years. They're allowed to speak Lashon Hara about them, Goim that hate Jews. Allowed, not allowed. Lashonara not allowed. But fighting them, deciding them yet, but not Lashonara. Chafetz Chaim say, and you know, if Chafetz Chaim allows something, there's no question that it's allowed. Chafetz Chaim say, Efshar ledaber lashon ara al apikors. Kofer apikors. The only problem today is that not, it's very hard to tell exactly who's an apikors and who's not. Maybe this Russia was born in Siberia and he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know. It's not that he knows and still fight against the Torah or, or violate Shabbat. He has no idea what Shabbat is. It's, it's a problem to know is an apikores. 
if you put it in the, in the hands of the public to decide who is an Apicorist, for the purpose of speaking Larshan Ara, everyone is an Apicorist. Right? It makes life easy. You can talk about everyone. But the people do not know to determine which person is, a, is forced to be an Apicorist because he was born to such parents and never went to yeshiva or never heard about Torah or Shabbat. Or someone who knew about it, he grew up in yeshiva, he went to religious school, and he's just a rasha. The answer is, it's recommended not to talk, because there's always a fear that this person doesn't know. But if a person spoke about them, you have what to count on. There's plenty of poskim, the chathila say, no, no problem. You see Rasha, you don't have an obligation to investigate why he's Rasha. Why? Because he was a kid, because he was abused, because his rabbi beat him up, or because his father did something to him. It's not realistic. Right now, is a danger to the Torah? Yes. Is a danger to religion? Yes. Is danger to religious people? Yes. He's making damages to the Torah with his behaving, with his speeches, with what he writes in the internet. Yes. So he's Yatsa Michlal Amitecha. Amitecha means colleagues. Kalig. What's Kalig? Kalig la mitzvot. Like a unit. You have a unit, they have all have to pray now in Minyan. And one is not, is not a Kalig. Therefore, it's like an external thing. It's not a part of it. It says, the, the chief rabbi, Rabbi Herzog, the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Israel, they ask him a question about his son that was the president of Israel. The first president of Israel, his name was, Rab, it was Mr. Chaim Herzog, which wasn't religious. The son of the chief rabbi of Israel became the president of Israel, and he was a secular person. So they say to him, they ask him if they're allowed to speak Lashon Ara about his son or no, based on this Hafez Chaim. <laughs> it's a good question. So it says like this. We have a say, the apple did not fall, fa fall far from the tree, which means the children similar to their parents. They get a lot of similarities. So they ask him, what about this? Your son fell far away from the tree. You're the chief rabbi of Israel, is a kofer. So he answered, the apple does not fall far from the tree. That's when there is a normal wind. But when there's such a tournament, you know, like such a storm, the apple can fall far from the tree, which means there's such danger to Judaism in this generation. Today it's a million times worse than it's time. Internet, Facebook, prostitution in every corner, people are naked, the world became a zoo. This is 70 years ago, this story, or 80. So he said, because there are things that can take the son of the biggest rabbi and turn him into a goy, because of the storm that is on the streets. He meant the Ascala movement, the reform Jews, the reform movement, the damage that they make to the, official, to the original Torah. If he lived today, there's no question. There's no wonder you can be the greatest Chacham and your kids from the streets become monsters. No control over it. So basically what he meant, even though he gave him a good education, the wind, make the apple fall far from the tree, which means even though he knew, he got good education in the house, it's still there is a reason why he became what he became. Bottom line, after all this beautiful explanation, if you did it, you have who to count on. What's recommended to do? Not to talk against anyone, not even go in. Well, you get used to it. Once you get used to something, the next thing you speak about the chief rabbi. Usually, from my experience, I saw people who begin to distinguish. Oh, he is allowed, he is not allowed, allowed, not allowed. A year later, he speaks about everyone. Yeah. But what if it's common knowledge? Everybody knows the guys are 
what's already three people knows and the whole world knows, it's not falling into the category of Lashonara. But still falling into Ve'afta Le'reacha Kamocha, but it may be Re'acha, because maybe he has no idea, what, I mean, he grew up like a goy, and he's like Tinok Shenishba. So even though he doesn't look like Re'acha La Mitzvot, because he, no, he has nothing in mutual to you, and he doesn't keep any mitzvah, but since he grew up in such mentality, it doesn't mean he's a bad person. If you would grow up in Bnei Brak or Mea Sha'arim, he would be more righteous than you. So it's a complicated thing. Bottom line, there, sometimes there is no black and white here. It's a gray area. And when, when you have a little doubt about it, better not to violate a, a, a restriction from the Torah. We can live without speaking Lashonara about them. It's not that it's an obligation to. The only thing, the only time it becomes a real issue if you have to warn from them. That's already a different category. Which means someone is about to invest money by them. You have to tell him, be careful from him, he's a thief. Or be careful from him, he's not Shomer Shabbos. Don't invest by a person that is not Shomer Shabbos. It's going to create you a lot of problems. So now, if you sit still and you say, listen, you know what? What is it, my business? I'm going to speak Lashon Ara about this Chiloni. I don't want to speak Lashon Ara. I'm Machmir. Like I just said, the rabbi said it's recommended not to speak Lashon Ara about anyone. But now it's the opposite. Now it's mitzvah to speak Lashon Ara. Lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. A kosher Jew is about to lose all his money. Or there is a 10% chance that he lose all his money. That's already, that's already an obligation to go warn him. You don't have to tell him what to do. You just tell him, I just want you to know, in case you didn't know, you're investing money by a person that does not keep mitzvot and have no fear for Hashem. Whatever he does, it's his problem after all. The Torah says, Don't speak Lajon Ara gossip about your nation. From here we learn on other nations you're allowed. But it goes back to what I said before. Better not to get used to it. If you did, you don't get a punishment. If you did, no one can say anything. But if you start getting used to it, tomorrow you begin to speak about your own brothers. Next thing. It's a question. Is it allowed for a student to tell the teacher about other students that bullies, they do all kinds of things that are not proper in yeshiva. So he's allowed to be quiet, to go quietly to tell the teacher, you know, they do this, they do that, they hit, they push, they pick on people. Is he being bullied himself? Today, bullying is what next? Today, it's an epidemic today. Yeah. It happens almost in every school. So if he's to protect himself, it's needless to say. If they're attacking him and yordim lechayav, then of course the Rebbe has an obligation to protect him as much as he can. The question is, what if they do things that is nothing to do with me? They watch st bad things on the internet. They have a phone, non-kosher phone. They go up to the back of the yeshiva and they watch things they're not supposed to do. So me as a student, I run away from them. But do I have an obligation to run to their parents or to the rabbi to tell what they do? Yes. It's an anonymous tip, maybe. Sure. The answer, everything le toilet, it's an obligation. You don't mean to hurt them, you mean to save their soul. They may look at that as you coming to damage them. Better they get kicked out now and they do tshuva and maybe in the long run they get saved than you pretend you didn't see it. And it's only going to get worse and worse. And one day they will get caught. And by now, it's going to be impossible to fix. I spoke last year about a person. And I'm about to go and to, to apologize to him. But then he's going to ask me, what did you say about me? And when I say it, it's going to create a huge problem between me and him. Because he has no idea that that's what I think about him. So. Is there any way to do tshuva and ask Hashem for forgiveness without telling him that I spoke Lashonara about him? Yes. Or I still have to go and apologize to him? Yes. 
Who say it's machlokes? Very good. It's an argument between the Chafetz Chaim that say that you must say, and Rav Israel Misalant that say that it's going to cause him sorrow and pain. So by fixing one problem from the Torah, you're creating a new problem from the Torah. So what did you do by that? And the halacha is like Hafez Chaim or Rabbi Israel Misalant. Salanter. If you know it's going to cause him pain, it's only create new hatred that did not exist before. So you ask Hashem to forgive you, and that's it. Jeff, to stop, you can't do that. To stop without it is not tshuva. What's the question? Am I allowed to tell Ashonara to my husband? No. no. Between husband and wife, ishtoke gufo, it's considered one body. It's like I'm taking, talking to myself. If it's therapeutic for the wife, then maybe, yeah. If it's about her work, not safe. If it's therapy for her to get it out of her chest, like she's under pressure now at work or things that happen, so as a part of like being her psychologist, he listens to all the problem coming out. But it's just for the sake of gossip. Did you hear what car Moshe bought his wife? I can't believe it. I told you they're not poor like they claim. What therapy is here? What therapy is here? She read my mind. You see what a clever girl? I'm trying to drink already for the last hour. My mouth is thirsty like, this, like, the, like the desert. But I say to myself, if I drink from the bottle now, thousands of people would see it. So what kind of rabbis they drink like on the street? You understand? But she read my mind. Very clever. <laughs> what a nisayon. The mouth is, the tongue is sticking to the, to the mouth. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam she'akon niya bidvaro. Amen. You know, it's like putting a steak in front of a dog when his mouth is black. <laughs> if you don't have the key to open, <laughs> All right, next. Am I allowed to speak negative about a Jew without mentioning his name? No I know who I'm talking about. I saw this guy, Froom. You should see what he did. Da, da, da. But nobody knows who I'm talking about. Who are you speaking to? I don't have any, I don't give any hint who I'm talking about. I don't give a hint. It could be anyone in the world. What's the purpose of talking about it? To teach that people that are from not perfect. No. <laughs> no. To warn him not to be like that. Or to teach my son not to be naive, that to see everyone has a beard, to trust him. Yeah, you ought to do that. It's allowed. The Ramban says, if you don't say names or hints, nobody knows who you're talking about, it's permitted. Rabbeinu Yonah, which was also very big from the same time, more or less, like the Rambam, he said it's not allowed. <coughs> Am I allowed to talk Lashonara about public figures that everybody knows they corrupted? If it's a guy? Goy, we already answer. We're talking about a Jew. How everybody knows. The answer that. is, you're not allowed to speak Lajonara about their personal life. The problem is that they are public people, and you want to warn the public from them, not to vote for them, not to give them donations. And that's already that's already good because you're saving innocent people from losing their money to such a corrupted person. So that's a mitzvah. However, it's not relevant that he hit his wife or that he get drunk at home after work. What does it have to do with the case? So we have to know, we see, you have to learn a lot of details. What's, if you finally warn someone not to go a little bit too far. Yes? What, what if they support uh, positions that are against You see what it is like here? It's like a, the commercial coming in, you know? <laughs> Speak. You know how they want to cut the speaker on the radio, and he talks, and he talks, 
So they begin to play the music, he gets the point. When you look at a politician, if they're uh, perceived to be orthodox or whatever, and they support positions that are against the Torah, do you have an obligation to speak against that so that people have the wrong idea and think that's the correct way to Sometimes people are sure that it's against the Torah, but maybe there is a point in the Torah that permits it. It's a question to a big rabbi, depend on the case. First, you have to see what they say. If they promote gay marriage, then you know everybody understands that it's against the Torah. You don't need to ask a rabbi. Or if they promote to eat non-kosher food, because it's cheaper, then of course you know. But there are sometimes cases that it's a questionable thing. It's a questionable thing. You need a shelat chacham. Next question. It's a public news about what, what is the permission to make Pashkevils, like they do, flyers? They give thousands of them in Israel against a, somebody, like he wants to be the mayor, he wants to be the Rosh Hashiva, he wants to get elected for the, for the board of, the, of education. So they make thousands of flyers all over the streets, everywhere you go. You pick them up, you see, be careful not to vote for this person, be careful, da 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 da, and destroying his life. Is this, is Erev Rav? Well, is there any permission for that or no? No. It's done every second for many, many years. Plus, you're messing up the streets also. The answer is there is no permission whatsoever in the Torah to make those flyers against people and give them out. It's called Arur Makere Eu Baseter. It's a violation of the Torah. You publish it, and of course they don't know who did it, and they give it all out. And even if they know, it's still a sin. Most of the time they don't tell you who they are. It's the same thing like writing comments about someone in the internet and hiding your identity. That's a sin from the Torah. Arur Makere Eu Baseter. Someone who hide and hit his friend is cursed. Arur is the worst curse in the Torah. But that's a curse not from a person, it's a curse from Hashem. And a curse from Hashem is just a matter of time until it destroys the person. So all these people who does it will pay a tremendous price eventually. All the stories of the Tanakh about holy people that made mistakes and sins, why is not publishing their sins to the whole world for the history, why Hashem allowed it in his book? Who has to know that David Amelech made mistake with Bathsheba? Why do you tell us this story? After all, he was a tzaddik. He made one mistake in his life. Hide it. Why do you have to tell the whole world about it? Is that that the question is, if people would learn from it not to, that, to do that mistake, is that justified to publish about a big tzaddik, something personal that he made a mistake in his life? Is it permitted to put it in a book that it will be in every house in the world? Obviously it is. What is important is that telling the truth. The truth is more important than just hiding it for another purpose. So the telling the truth is the first priority. The answer is, Lashon Ara Letoelet is permitted. Letoelet means to improve the world to show you that you can be the biggest Gaon and Tzaddik and Kadosh and still make horrible scenes like this. Right. But at the same time, when Hashem already spoke something like this about one of them, He made sure that everyone would know that they were loved and righteous and in the highest level. So there's no contradiction that even people that are very high can make mistakes here and there. And it still makes them very big Tzaddikim even if they have one weakness or two. But they, in 99% of the things, they're very good. So, yeah, well, no one is perfect. And they did tshuva. And even if they didn't do tshuva, they got isurim for that. They paid the price. <laughs> All kinds of things that they have, it erased. Erased the punishment that they deserve to get. Am I allowed to sue a Jew in a secular court ever? We well, you know in general it's not allowed. It's a very big sin. There is any exception to the rule who permits a Jew to take another Jew to the secular court or to a non-Jewish court. 
he doesn't listen to Bezdin's verdict? So we already said in the past, if you invite him to Bedin and he does not come three times, the Bedin make an attempt to, call, to send him an invitation and he ignores it, they give you permission in writing, take him to the court of the Goim, let them do whatever they do with him. Then, uh, then obviously you're not violating the rules of the Torah. You ask him to come, he takes advantage, he doesn't come, you're going to pay by the Goim. What happens if you are a landlord and your tenant doesn't pay you a few months' rent? And the contract you made with him, it's a contract you bought in Staples. It's printed, comes already standard. And it says over there that he's going to pay legal fees and, you know, the rest, uh, whatever it is. Now you, have, now you take him to Beddin. Beddin doesn't have the power to evict him. You need a marshal. If Beddin will send a letter to the marshal, Huh? Tony Smith, the marshal of New York, he gets a letter, Rabbi Leibovitz. Who is this? Dear Tony Smith, I am the chief rabbi of Brooklyn, Rabbi Leibovitz. I order you to go and evict Mr. X from apartment such and such because he doesn't pay rent. What's Tony going to do with that? Throw it to his dog to eat it. So what's the point of wasting time in Jewish Beddin if anyway nobody can do anything with it? Good point, no? What's the answer? In that case, I allowed to go right away to the court and say he doesn't pay me the rent and let them take actions to evict him or no? Two years later, they're not. What is the difference between the, the, the regular argument, the argument about the rent? Same thing. Take it to be deem, call him for three times, if not, not. If he doesn't obey the rules, the, the, the verdict of the Bedin, then you allow to take him to the regular court. But as a Jew, you, and he is a Jew, you are the Jew, you both believe in Hashem, you must try to take him to the Bedin. That's your first priority. Sometimes, when you take him to Bedin, he may make claims why he doesn't pay the rent. As a leak, as a beehives that you're supposed to clear. There's hazards, the kids got wounded. Not only I did not sue him for a million dollars for the damage, he wants the $2,000 rent. All of a sudden, in a bed din, they find out that not only he doesn't owe you, you actually owe him a lot more. He has to live there 10 years for free. There's cases like this. I'm sorry, you were both, you were both, you were both Jew, so you follow by, uh, by the bed din who are enforcing the Jewish laws. That's what I'm saying. Which is good. Unfortunately, you want to be a Jew and get the benefits of being a son of Hashem. Sometimes you're going to be suffering because you're a son of Hashem and you're a landlord. I think, you, I think you didn't pay attention to what I was saying. No, I understand. You said that instead of evicting him, the bad thing can rule it in his favor because he can make the excuses that something happened in the apartment, like calendar, like was not fixing, was leaking, and instead of just making the ruling to your favor as a landlord, which is quite a staple contract, they can make the ruling to his favor. That's what you said. And I said, unfortunately, that's what the Jewish justice is. And being a son of Hashem, a servant of Hashem, sometimes you get the benefit because you are chosen, and sometimes because of the bad din rule, not into your favor, you're going to be suffering. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, po the post button works. Now I have to tell you, after your beautiful speech, which I didn't understand a word of it, but <laughs> I'll tell you very simple why you must go to bed in. Why? You go to bed in. My, my tenant does not pay me rent, so they call him in. Now, now he comes to Bedin, and the Bedin makes you sign a letter that this is holding you liable as an arbitration. Bedin, there's a law in the United States. There is a law. What's the law? The law is that a person doesn't have to go to court. If him and his friend wants to sit in front of another friend and make him an arbitrator, even though he doesn't have any legal education, Hooven and Shimon, or Tony and Vini, they <laughs> want to go to another friend, you be the judge between us. 
we have a case, so he make them sign that I, whatever I will rule, it's as an arbitrator, will not be contested, will not be appealed, and you accept on yourself to pay it, whether you understand or not understand my judgment. And you don't have the right to ask for explanation why I rule like that. And I make them sign. So now, if the Beddin, the Jewish Beddin, said to the tenant that he must leave the apartment in 30 days and he has to pay $7,000, and he signed that the Beddin, he accept them as an arbitrator, all you have to do is to go to the non-Jewish court, present it, that's it, they don't open the case. There's no permission to open the case. It's called arbitration. arbitration. Very interesting, a lot of people do not know it. So right away, the judge force the judgment and move it into the marshal like it's his own rule. And will give you a very big yell, why are you wasting the time of the court? Will get you very angry at you, why you still came to the court after you signed that you accept them as arbitrator. Therefore, you don't have any, any excuse not to go to a Jewish Bedin. What excuse you have? However, there's no Jewish police today. If you have to evict someone, what are you going to do? Send him, uh, what's their name? Not Haverim. The other one. Shomrim. But now, Shomrim, it's history. That's it. You hit a person or two. Now the, the, the police is all over now. They don't let. That's the problem in Israel. They complain about the rabbinical court, Beddin, when, when a husband does not give a get to his wife, he keeps her aguna. So they get, the secular people get very angry at the rabbis why they do not allow her to marry without a get. I don't understand the concept of a get. They get very angry. Wow, she's five years alone. The husband left her. He lives with another woman. He will leave her like this to die. He doesn't care. So what kind of a Torah is this, that a woman would stay lonely? They get angry. So what do they do? They constantly smash the reputation of the bed din, and they are nothing but big liars. Why are they liars? Because the Torah gave power to the bed din to break the bones of this husband, if it's necessary, until he give her the get, to take away all his rights, to put him in prison to put a harem on him. He cannot enter any shul. They can do whatever they want to him. If it would be the laws of the Jewish state will go by the Jewish law, the law of God, not one woman would stay aguna for more than a week. Why? They'll take away his license. They'll separate him from the community. If he has a butcher shop, no one is allowed to buy from him. They will make him so miserable that as much as he hates his wife and want to see her suffer, his suffering is a hundred times worse than her. He'll feel the pain. So maybe, 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 once in a hundred years there will be a case or two that a woman will not get her get. All other cases will be resolved one, two, three. But these hypocrite liars, this is what they do. They take the power from the hands of the Jewish court. You're not allowed to take violence or actions against anyone. You're only allowed to rule in religious issues. And that's it. And the rest is in our hands. So, and they do not know, do anything. So what's the point? The Torah, it's a combination. The Torah say the man must divorce his wife. The Torah gave the solution what happened when the man does not give her the get. So they only took half, and the other half, the solution, they made it illegal. You're not allowed to smack the husband. You're not allowed to do things against him. You're not allowed. And if you do, the rabbi will go to jail, just like happened here in Monsi. They're about to put somebody in for a long, long time. Why? They went after someone with violence to get a get for a woman. They want to put them more than 20 years in prison now for doing it. So what's going on here? That's a, that's a lie. Cannot come and present, oh, you see why she's a guna in this woman? Because of the Torah, because of the laws of the rabbis. That's not true. She's aguna because of you. You are the reason. You, the, the secular, wicked, liar government. You are the source of all the problems. And you put the problems on other people. If you would comply with the law of the Torah, you would make the Israeli law, husband that doesn't give a get to his wife, 
whatever the rabbinical court decide to take sanction and action against him, we will force it by the police. Not one woman will be aguna within a week. Okay, but what's the purpose of having it in the Torah that the husband, man, must give the divorce? Must. No, I didn't say he must. Oh, wait. You're not focused. I didn't say he must. Sometimes the bed didn't find that he doesn't have to give her a get. After the bed didn't check the entire case, they tell her you're not entitled to. The Torah says that if bed din tells you to give your divorce, you, you should give your without enforcing. If the bed din telling you that the Torah saying the woman only can get a divorce if husband agrees. Correct? That's the difference between a woman and a man. But if the bed din tells him, even though you disagree to give a get, after we check the case and we saw that you violent and you hit her and you did this and you did that, after or alcohol or gambling or who knows what, there's a whole package. So the bed din force, they say, we decided that you must give her a get. And he doesn't want. Where in the Torah says that bed din have such a power? In the Torah, I know where it says that husband shoot or... Okay. The Torah says the Chachamim has permission to decide whatever they want. Not only that. Much more critical things than that. Kol asher yomru lecha tishma bekolam. You have to listen to the Chachamim. Chachamim don't sit and enjoy to make decisions based on what they feel like. They go by what the Torah says. Am I allowed to go to law school? I'm a religious Jew. I want to be a lawyer or a judge in a secular court with my keeper, Am I allowed to go to law school like some religious people do, or it's a very big sin? No, you're not allowed. What do you think? No, not allowed, because you will be jacked. So far, everything you said today, the answer was the opposite. No, 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 every time I was right, but you, we just disagree with you. You know what I mean, right? But you continue to push me in the wrong direction. The answer is, listen, to be a judge, no religious Jew is allowed. You're not even allowed to put mezuzah in a, Jew, in a secular court in Israel. Not allowed to put mezuzah. You have to take off the mezuzah from the door. Definitely not to make bracha. It's a place of merit in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's like building a church and wants to put mezuzah inside and make bracha. What kind of nonsense is that? This is a place that every minute over there, they smash and rip the Torah to thousands of pieces. The Torah say A, they say the opposite. The Torah say B, they say the opposite. The Torah say no two men can get married and have relationship. They say they, not only they can get married, they get rights, and they better than you that you married to a woman. That's what they said in Tel Aviv. The Torah say if you do such and such, you have to get executed by them, it's mitzvah. Why you bother us? Let him go. The Torah says you're not allowed to sell a shonara even if it's the truth. They say, oh, if it's the truth, there's no case. Basically, every one of the rules is against Hashem. So therefore, no Jew is allowed to step in this building unless if he doesn't have a choice. What does it mean, doesn't have a choice? They send you an invitation to come testify for an accident you saw. If you're not going to go, they'll arrest you. What are you going to do? You're going to sit in jail all your life? So you come and you, see what you, you say what you said. Not that you believe in them. All the rulings of the secular court in Israel, none of them ever went into action in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All the money that they made, they made people pay people, everything has to return back to the giver. All decisions they made is canceled retroactively. None of them ever went into action in Shamaim. So it means if they told you, if you took someone to a secular court and the Israeli judge said that he has to give you $8 million and you took the money, it's count like you went into his house and stole the money from his pocket. And you're going to get punished for this money even if he really owes you the money. Do you understand what I just said? Listen good, again. There was a delegation in a business you sued him for $8 million. If you sue him in a Jewish court, they would agree to your case and will make him pay you the $8 million. But since you went to a secular court, and they came with the same verdict, exactly of what the Torah, same verdict, and you took the money, you are a thief. You cannot be a part of the minyan. 
No shul is allowed to let you in. They cannot put your children in schools. Nobody is allowed to marry you. You, are a big, you have a big X on you in this world and in the afterworld. You, you mamash moser. It's called moser. That's a horrible thing. How many Jews like this walking around us in the shuls? He saw him in, a, in Manhattan here by the Goim. Who gave you permission to sue him there? You had to take him to Bedin. Bedin can tell you about money, much better than the secular court when it comes to issues like this. But what happened? They do whatever they want. Why? They want the money now. They're not worried about what Hashem thinks. Am I allowed to testify in a secular court the truth against someone that lie? In other words, Shimon lent money to Reuven, and Reuven denied it. But I was a witness. And they're both secular, so they won't go to rabbinical court. And I'm religious. So now they go to court, and he is calling me, because I was the witness when I saw it. I was in a room, so he called me to tell the secular judge if I saw that he gave him the money or not. So am I allowed to tell them I will only testify if you take him to rabbinical court? No, you're not allowed. You must testify. Oh, I must go. You must. By the, by the commandments about not, not being a false witness, you must testify. No, but false witness and all that is talking about rabbinical court, not by them. In any court, you are false witness. Even, even if you're silent, even if you don't testify, if you just if you testify, that's a comment about the commandments. You're still a false witness, even if you keep silent over there. So now it's, there's a problem. Depend what the case is. If he lend him the money and he doesn't want to return by claiming he never received it, and I'm going to go to the court and say, yes, he did lend the money, so what's going to be? The judge tell him, return what you took. Return. So that's very good. Everyone is happy. Anyway, I didn't have a choice. They forced me to come. But what happened? If I'm a stockbroker, and next to me there's another stockbroker, and someone called him from the bank and told him, tomorrow morning this stock will go high, buy a lot. And I heard the conversation, because I'm sitting right next to him. So he bought a lot of stocks, and tomorrow he doubled. He make a few million dollars, and they caught him. Now they called me to testify against him in a court here. Two Jews, I have to testify if he got the tip or not. Now, if I tell them that, yes, I heard that he got the tip, they'll put him five, six years in prison and take $10 million from his bank account penalty. How can I testify against him when I know, according to the Torah, he did not violate any rules? And even if he violate the rules of the state, that justify from the Torah to send him five years in prison and take $10 million from him? It's not a trick. It's not a It's not, not, not no violation at all from the Torah inside trading. It's like your friend told you, go buy a good business. But even if it is, it's a double, double money you get to pay in the worst case scenario. Right? So in that case, my testimony will give this Jew a, a punishment that is innocent, according to the Torah. But what choice do you have? Not to testify, they put you in jail. Oh, so, so no, no. Falsely, you cannot. You cannot be falsely witness. So what, am I allowed to tell? Am I allowed to tell? The answer, I'm not allowed to tell what I heard. I have to go to a rabbi, and the rabbi has to check what punishment is subject to. And after they check that, if he doesn't deserve it from the Torah, I'm going to be the cause that this innocent person will go to jail for not doing any crime against the Torah. I'll give you an example of what happened one time to Rabbi Zilberstein. Rabbi Zilberstein is one of the biggest rabbis in the world. And uh, he went to the hospital. And they called in the microphone, doctor, such and such, come to emergency room quickly. That was a life and death issue. So he ran, and there was a, there's a bag there of a very expensive Nikon camera, worth more than $1,000. And while he, ran, while he ran, the leash of the bag got stuck in his, in his legs and pulled the bag, and the camera came out of the bag and smashed and broke. And the person that, uh, that, you know, that was the owner of the camera was standing by the desk with his back to the case. He didn't see, because there's noise there in the hospital. He turned around, and he came, and he saw his camera on the floor. He went crazy. 
So he looked at Rav Zilberstein, that saw who did it. Told him, who did it? So he told him, I didn't see. He said, what do you mean you don't see? You're facing it. How didn't you see? So he said to him, even if I would see, I would not tell you. Why? Because according to the Torah, sometimes a person make a damage and he's not, doesn't have to pay. So he did not want to tell him. Why? Because then he would take this doctor to the court, to the secular court, and the foolish secular court would make him pay him $1,000. But the Torah says, if you run to save life, and you made physical damage to property, you don't have to pay. The Torah say you don't have to pay. If you come to put fire off, because people may get killed, and while you're putting the fire off, you broke a vase in Jewish Beit Din, you don't have to pay even if the vase is $10 million. doesn't matter. I came to save life. I came to save people. I am not responsible for any damages. But in their court, that will make him pay for the camera. So you see that his testimony could get that innocent doctor to lose money. He didn't tell him. And if he called him to court, he would go to court and say, I didn't see, I'm sorry. Say, so Rabbi, Rabbi, we know you're lying. You know what you want and know. It's your problem. I did not see. That's it. That's what this guy should do. I didn't hear anything? Of course not. What if he, what if he... Today, it's another problem. Today, if you see an accident, you have to think a million times before you tell the police that you saw it. Because you become full-time worker for them for free. Come here, we have to ask you again. They come to your home, they call you to the prison. Who pays you for all this? Anybody pays you for the days you lose? No. Not only that, you risk your life. What happens if this guy is Tony Mafioso? <laughs> the next thing, you get killed, or your kids, or he burns your car. You want to be a good citizen, you get killed. Not only that, when I came to America in 1989, my father friend <laughs> picked me up in the airport. On the way from JFK to Great Neck, he was giving me a lesson about the life in the United States. I won't tell you everything he said, but I'll tell you one thing he did say. He told me in this country, if you see a person laying on the floor in an accident about to die, you never get off your car and come to help him. You pretend you didn't see and go quickly from the place. So I said to him, what are you saying? To let him die? He said, yes, don't dare to come help him. So I asked him, how come? He said, this is how he used to talk, listen to me. I'm telling you, you go and help him, you save his life, a week later you get a $10 million lawsuit that because you move him, he cannot function and they make you pay him. That's the law of this stupid country. But Baruch Hashem, someone told me recently, they changed that rule. Finally, they got a brain after who knows how many years. But at that time, it was 100% right. You come to help a stranger, in the end, this ungrateful person sue you. Whether you made him a damage or not, maybe the damage was from the accident, not from moving you. But he's gonna get a liar doctor and bribe him to testify that because you move him, that's what happened. And it, everything is corrupted. Remember, chesed, kindness, helping to the public, it's only if it doesn't come of your expense, of your life, of your children's life, etc. If I have to ruin my life to save you, I don't have an obligation like this from the Torah. If I have to lose a finger, I'm gonna lose a finger to save another Jewish person's life. I don't have an obligation. It would be very nice of me to do so. I have permission to do so. But if I did not do it, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a criminal. I, wa I want my finger. I don't want to have nine fingers. But a Jew died. The rules in the Torah. You don't risk organs of your body. You don't have an obligation in order for you to save other person's life. Kidney, for instance. It's a very nice thing to give. You have an extra one. You can live. What, what do you care of saving life? By the way, just in case you didn't know, a person, most people, that they have a relative in a family that their kidney stopped to work, and they have to go on a surgery, they remove their kidney to give a kidney, and now they risk their life. Maybe one day they are, the only kidney that they have would stop. They will need a transplant. So they are taking some kind of a risk here. 
So it's a very, very big mitzvah, no? A kidney wart in a black market, $150,000 today. Not include the doctors and the surgery and all the, the things around it. So it's a very, very nice thing. You give about something that has a value of 150,000. You go through the suffering to save the life of your cousin. In case you didn't know, there is a bigger mitzvah than that. You take Torah and Science DVD, it cost you one dollar. You give it to your cousin, it's Michalel Shabbat. You make him Shomer Shabbat, it count a million times bigger than mitzvah than giving him a kidney. How come people never think? One dollar. He became Shomer Shabbat. Hashem is much more happy than you than giving this kidney. Why? You give your cousin a kidney and he is alive. In the next 40 years, he's going to do one billion sins and make Hashem and so many other people miserable from his behaving. Thanks to your kidney. Thanks to your kidney, he violates 52 Shabbatot every year, multiplied by 40 more years of life. And he torture people, and he steal money, and he never pray, and he does all kinds of other sins. Of course, you're not held liable for his sins, because after all, you did a mitzvah for giving him life. But the Torah say, I'm at nefesh, somebody who was about to be chaz v'shalom egoi, you're saving him and you bring him back to Hashem, as a much bigger mitzvah. Wait, wait, wait. You're not saving wait, wait. his body. You're saving his soul, right? By giving him a kidney. So this is a requirement from the Torah, to save his soul. So it is exactly what the Torah requires you. Saving the, saving, the saving the soul means, saving the soul meaning making the soul religious, making that person religious, making him stay alive physically. The soul, instead of being in this body, would go up to Hashem. Now it stay here in this world for another 30, 40 years and accumulate many sins. So next time you have a Jew who has to be rushed to the hospital on Shabbat, don't do it. Because anyway, his soul will go to Hashem. What's the way what I would waste my Shabbat? No, the law requires you to do this. Even to break the Shabbat, the most important thing in Judaism. In case you know, or you don't know, there's a very big argument in a poskim if you're allowed to violate Shabbat to save a secular Jew. Or goyim. <laughs> Or goyim. Or goyim. But goyim, the, the Gemara already spoke about it. But secular Jews, it's something that, that did not exist in those days. They were here, of course, here and there. But like this, in Paresia, it doesn't care. It goes like a goy. There's a big question if you're allowed to violate Shabbat to save him. There are, there's reasons why the halacha in the end is to do save him. But it's not so simple. If you learn the entire subject, You'll be amazed. The reason that we're saving him I, I, I is know. not what people think. I know, but the halacha is you still have to rush him. But for different reasons than what people but think. not to save his body, to save his soul, that's the reason you're rushing to the hospital. Exactly. And then in this case, exactly. you kidney. I didn't say to save the kidney is not a mitzvah. Again, I said it's a very nice sacrifice. But I said there is a higher mitzvah which costs a lot less. <laughs> you want to buy a diamond for a dollar or for $150,000? Same diamond. What would you do? Pay a dollar or pay 150,000? And the answer is, you always get what you pay for. I the blood is an organ. You have to give blood also. No. Blood is not organ. Mitzvah to give blood. Mitzvah to give blood. They have a Shomer Shabbos blood bank in Israel. If a person pay a fee, that in case he ever need blood transfusion, they give him from Shomer Shabbat that it's kosher. Because he doesn't want to get from someone who eats taref. Because the blood is not pure, not kosher. Now let's talk a little bit. Should we start a new chapter? Huh? Are you tired already? No. You're tired? What about a dozen? Who wants to continue another 15 minutes? No, why 15 minutes? Let's go another hour. No, I don't want to force myself on you. No, no, 15 minutes, I mean 15 minutes. Shh. Regarding the divorce, some bezins are known to be corrupt, okay? Like that histor history about that, or like said, they give a hetave or a bottom for the guys, and the girls are always left out, basically. And some people, oh, I own, I'm only going to go to this best, and otherwise I'm not interested. So what do you do with that? If you suspect that the bedding is not kosher, go to a different bedding. No, but the, I'm only allowing, in other words, the guy tells the girl, I'll only give you the get if you come to this best. And the guy knows that they're on his side. You know, in this world, you can fool anyone. Everyone, everyone. But what happened to fooling people? 
you have to face the same case when you come in front of Hashem and face the consequences. No, the question is, can the girl take a guy to court? Because she knows now that... Well, if she get him, if she take him to court, the court cannot force him to give her a get. What is she gaining by that? The court can. It's called, it's called a get law. It's not allowed. Not allowed. Not allowed to go to court. Now. Shh. Now, what about? Is that love? Two peasants, and they have two people, and they select a third. Two people. They have the bedding has two people. Well, if each one wants to use a different bed, so then they... You have to go... The person who gets sued in a bed din has the right to choose which bed din to go to. So if you want to sue him in a bed din in Brooklyn and he lives in Queens, he says, okay, come to the bed din here in town. Or if you're here and he's in LA, you will have to go to his place. That's the rule. Is that both in Brooklyn? Huh? Both if both beds in Brooklyn, he still have the rights to choose which bed in to go to. Why? Maybe he suspects that you bribe the bed in that you're calling. He wants his own bed in. You understand? I got to tell you something. The world is not a perfect place. We're far from being perfect. But the chances that you have in bed in to get justice is at least 100 times bigger than to get it in. So the world is not a perfect place, as I told you. And you gave me permission to go 15 more minutes, so uh, you took a very big risk. You said that this is 100% better than any second. Yeah, and I said that the chance, the chance, the chance that uh, a person will get justice in a bad din is 100 times greater than a secular for one reason. Why? Because even if the secular bad din judging fairly, which means the secular judge, that particular one is a very honest person. But the law is corrupted. He follow guidelines that were made by people who had no idea about Hashem. So they made rules based on their common sense, what they copy from the Turks or the British or different kinds of goyim, which is violating and contradicting the Torah. And the judge hands are tied. He has to go by the rules and the constitution of the state. It's not what he wants to do. This is what I said to my friend judge in San Diego. I told him, if you have a case that the, according to the Torah, the Jew is innocent, and you have to follow the law of San Diego over there, and it goes again against the Torah, what do you do in a case like this? All his career as a prosecutor, as a judge, I was the only one who had the guts to confront him with that. He has a yarmulke on his head. A judge, you know, a very big judge. I made him think about it. If I made him change or not, I don't know. But at least make him think about it. Could you take a guy to a secular court? Yeah, a guy won't come to bed in. If you have to sue a guy, you take him to secular court. What if you would go to bed in? If a guy agreed to come to bed in, you take him to bed in. And the bed in will, will reach justice. If he's right, they'll tell you that he's right. There was a case like this with Rabbi Zarihan in Morocco. There was a rabbi, a Moroccan rabbi. There was one Jew and one Muslim Moroccan, and the Muslim Moroccan knew the Jew is religious. So he told them, I'm going to Saudi Arabia for the Ramadan. So I want to leave my 50,000 lira by you. And I go there, and it was, uh, this was in a, maybe almost 100 years ago, the story. You know, they had to go on animals. They didn't go with cars or trains or planes. So you say, if I ever get killed on a road or something happened to me, if you see that by the end of the year I don't come back, you can keep the money for yourself. But when I come, you give me back the money. And the Jews say, fine. And this, uh, the Muslim went there. Uh, and after a while, he came back. And he came to the Jew. And the Jew already, in his mind, was sure that he's, he, he got 50,000 lira. He was very happy about it, and all of a sudden, Muhammad showed up. And when he saw him, he like seeing the devil, Tarte Mashma. So he, t he saw him, and he said to him, give me the money. He said, what money? He said, the money I left by you a few months ago. He said, come on, what's wrong with you? What money? You wanted to give me the money, in the end you never left it. What? Are you joking? This is all my money. So he said to him, no, I'm very sorry. So he said to him, you don't, you don't believe me. Take me to the, to the bed in. 
So he said, okay, let's go to the rabbi. So they went to Rabbi Zaryan, and the, and the rabbi listened to both of them. And the rabbi said to, to the Arab, can you step outside one second? So he went outside, and the rabbi said to this Moroccan Jew, great, you gave it to this Arab real good. You're such a smart guy. But how did you fool him like this? Pretend that he's happy. He said, Rabbi, you're not going to believe he's such a dumb <laughs> guy. He left me the money, no witnesses. So the rabbi said, police, there in those days, call, catch him. Call Muhammad. Come, Muhammad is going to pay you now the money, and we're going to put flyers about him as a thief, cannot be in a community. When a, when a Jew saw like that, right away he gave him back the money, and the Arab bought many kilos of butter and bread from the Jewish bakery, and he gave it to all the poor people in that city in Morocco, and he was going on the street and screaming, the justice is only by the Jews. That's a very big Kiddush Hashem. You understand? Anyway, so we'll say like this. Words that the Hebrew Academy, Academy making today, modern Hebrew words, the Jews that live in Israel have an obligation to accept them or they can refuse to use those words. The country made an academy. Whenever there's a word that we don't, it's a new word, crackpot. They have to invent, they have to invent a word for that, elevator. One day they invented elevator. There's no word for it, so now they may have to make a word in Hebrew. So the secular professors for Hebrew, they see it, and they decided to call it ma'alit, come from the word ole, ma'alit, ma'ale, ma'alit. Makes very sense. It's a modern word. So. Some people, like Satmer, they won't use this word. They get angry if you use this word. Why? Because it's a Zionist word. Anything that smells Zionist make them get goosebumps all over their body. So the question now, if, they, if you speak to him, he will tell you elevator. Or he will use a Yiddish word. But he won't use this. Now, a Jew that used this word, knowing wicked people made it, is he violating the rules of the Torah or no? Because for them, it's a very big sin to use Hebrew, modern Hebrew words, because they're made by communist people. Maybe today they're not communist anymore, because there's no, not, no communism in the world anymore. But the first one, Eliezer ben Yehuda and his friends, they were all anti-religious people. That's why they hate the modern Hebrew so much. If you speak in their shul Hebrew, they kick you out. I don't want to hear this language. There is Lashon Kodesh, the old ancient Hebrew of all the generations. Anything that is the modern Hebrew of the last 200 years, they don't want to hear. So the question now, if a person spoke, is he violating the rules of Hashem like they claim, or it's nonsense? We have to ask ourselves, when we speak English, the people that made the language, in, uh, the English language was any better than this communist? So why are they so happy to speak English, not making a big deal out of it, but when there's w the other wicked people made the modern Hebrew, they go crazy? No, there's, a di there's, there's still a difference. And self-hating Jews. The answer is, the people who made language, the language English, they did not go against the Torah and didn't cause us any damage as a nation. They made themselves a language. Whatever they want to do, it's their business. Now you want to use their language, fine. But the people who made the modern Hebrew, they actually did everything they can to destroy the Torah in every day's life. That's why they hate them so much. But the question now, an Israeli was born in Israel and he doesn't know any other language. That's the way he spoke, in school, in the house. Is he a violator of the rule of the Torah or not? 
now that it became a language, it's already not an ideal problem. It's really what people speak. Uh, There's one problem. Generally, the answer should be no, but there's a problem here. Why? Many, many years ago, I gave a lecture about intentional mistake in a modern Hebrew language. There's a Satmir Hasid that was very good in a language, wrote a book, not a, not a thick book. He gave in this book many, many words that we use today that actually means the opposite of what Hashem wanted. It cannot be coincidence that they took hundreds of words that mean right and they translated them left. Why they did it? To confuse the people that when they pray and they use all these words, they actually ask from Hashem something bad. They ask me now to give an example. I don't remember. It was years ago. I have to go into the archive and get that lecture from a long, long time ago. Maybe 10 years ago. I don't know. But the, the point, the one thing I do remember that when I made that lecture, it shocked many people that speak Hebrew all their life. They said, now we begin to understand Satmir. Now we understand where they come from. The answer is, people who were born into it, it's called Shogegim, Anusim. They don't know any better. If you use English words instead, better, but we are not educated to know. What are we going to do? Every word, we're going to make an investigation. That's why we continue to do what we do, and we are considered anusim. Now, in the last five minutes that we have, are we allowed to help reform Jews to make aliyah to Israel? Yes. Or since they are the most wicked people in the history of the world, better that they stay in the exile. Of course we're allowed. Of course we're allowed. Why not? No. Of course we're allowed. Not only allowed, but have to. You're allowed to help Maybe, maybe, help maybe, 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 maybe don't do their way that you are. At least they're going to be in the holy land. Before we go to the reforms, are we allowed to, make, to help secular people to come to Israel? Secular Jews? Secular Jews. Yes, absolutely. What's the problem by bringing secular Jews to Israel? It's all the government becoming more secular, and they destroy the yeshivot more and more and more. If most of the government would be religious, we see when the religious people were sitting in the government, they fought them. So the yeshivot were stable. As soon as the religious people lost their power, right away they smashed already more than half of the budgets of all the yeshivot. They want to send them all to the army. Basically, they're fighting big, in big force against the Torah. One of the reasons that they got more votes is because of all the extra growth and people and, uh, and many Russian goyim who came to Israel who are not religious. He gave them more power. So the question is, as religious people, and we send secular people to Israel, Secular Jews? Secular Jews, Jews. What? We're, not, we're only we're talking about Jews. We're not reading there. Because from the Torah, the land of Canaan belongs to Jews. We cannot change the Torah. So, we come from the written Torah, so you cannot do anything different. Even Chachamim cannot make a different decision. So that's a very interesting question. Is it mitzvah to bring wicked people to the Holy Land that they can fight against the religion more? I actually would give you this question as homework <laughs> for next Tuesday. Remember, it's a triple question. Conservative Jews, Reform Jews, and secular Jews. You go ask your rabbi, your teachers, every religious people around you this question. If it's mitzvah or it's an avera. Any Jews must go there. This is from Hashem. This is not from anybody else. We already have few opinions in the room. We'll see you, Bezrat Hashem, next Tuesday, 9 o'clock. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.